thank you for the invitation. I'm sorry I cannot uh, approach you in uh, Icelandic. I've had two Icelandic students when I was in Oslo, but I did not learn too many words. Uh, I will talk to you about uh, our experience uh, from interactions between aquaculture and uh, wild fish in, uh, in Norway. <clears throat> and the outline of, of uh, my talk is first uh, some of the numbers of farmed and, uh, and wild fish, uh, something about escaped farmed salmon, how they differ from wild salmon and how they enter in uh, rivers. I will um, say something from controlled whole, whole generation or whole life cycle experiments in uh, Norway and uh, Ireland. And then I will uh, say something about the genetic studies that we have uh, or are in the process of completing looking at the wild salmon in Norway and how they are introgressed or, uh, with farmed salmon, that is how they have incorporated uh, genetic material from spawning farmed salmon into their uh, genes. Uh, and then I, I will say a little about sea lice and uh, uh, end with some views uh, on some implications that I see for Iceland and Icelandic aquaculture and wild fisheries. Um, this uh, is a trend curve of the numbers of Atlantic salmon uh, approaching the Norwegian coast, what we call pre-fishery abundance. And uh, 30 years ago, we had a million salmon approaching the Norwegian coast every year. Uh, during the last few years, we have had roughly 500,000 salmon, or some, sometimes less than 500,000. So it's more than halved uh, since 1983, uh, which is a year when we believe that we have quite good uh, salmon catch statistics, uh, and also quite good estimates of the numbers of salmon. Uh, so this is... Um, a trend analysis which is carried out by a, a scientific committee for uh, advising Norwegian management on uh, Atlantic salmon biology and status. So if we look at the figures for 2014, uh, we caught 570 tons of wild salmon uh, along the coast and in the rivers. And at the same time, more than 2,000 times as much salmon was produced in, uh, in fish farms. Uh, the pre-fishery abundance that I showed on the previous curve was 475,000 wild salmon. Um, if we look at numbers in fish farms, um, one of these net pens on the photograph can hold 200,000 farm salmon, so three of them hold more than all of the wild salmon approaching the Nor Norwegian coast. Uh, fish farmers in Norway are much better today to sort of to keep the salmon in the nets than, than what they were uh, 30 years ago. Uh, but still the production of salmon or the number of farmed salmon is so high that uh, there are still quite a lot of escaped farmed salmon in the wild in Norway. Um, the average number of reported escapes in Norway since 1993 is uh, 378,000 uh, escaped farm salmon per year. Um, the worst year since 1993 was um, more than 900,000 salmon, that was uh, 2007. Uh, in 2008, we had uh, new uh, regulations in place for the uh, sort of technology of, of uh, fish farms and how they were anchored and so on. So the last few years have been somewhat uh, better, 160,000 last year. 2014, I believe, was close to 300,000. 
the Institute of Marine Research has uh, tried to estimate sort of what is the real number of escaped farm salmon as opposed to the reported number. And they believe that the real number of escaped farm salmon is um, two to four times as much as the reported number. So uh, likely not very far from one million fish escaping every year. Um, we know that, um, as uh, has been indicated in uh, Sigurdur's uh, talk, that farm salmon look different from wild salmon. They have a more uh, round body and they have somewhat eroded fins. But to be certain that a fish is an escaped farm salmon, we have to look at the scale patterns because they grow very different. Like in, in the wild, a salmon smolt like this has uh, two, three, four winter rings, whereas a farm fish may be only uh, half a year old at this size. Also, we know that uh, farm fish are selected for uh, performance in a captive environment. They are selected for, for faster growth, for uh, an intermediate CH at maturity, for uh, ver resistance to various diseases, uh, flesh quality, fat contents, uh, coloration, and so on. Um, whereas, and also, uh, farm salmon are, are adapted by natural selection to the captive environment. So we know that in tests that my colleagues have uh, done, offspring of farm salmon uh, are less prone to seek shelter, uh, or they appear earlier from shelter if they have been uh, frightened. Then they may seek shelter, but then they come out in the light again because they are sort of uh, adapted to, to a predator-free environment where, where uh, feed is coming Food is coming all the time from above. Also, we know that uh, farm salmon are genetically different from wild salmon. Uh, Sigurdur talked about uh, sort of the, the regional groups of Atlantic salmon in Europe. Um, Iceland forms a, a sort of an outgroup from the rest of European Atlantic salmon. And in Norway, we have two historical groups or two phylogenetic groups. One in uh, southern Norway, which is basically all of the coast of Europe, all the way up to Trom Tromsø, um, a little north of the polar uh, circle. And then there is a, uh, a northeastern, uh, we could call it a Barents Sea, Atlantic salmon, which is the county of Finnmark in northernmost Norway, and uh, the Kola Peninsula. And, uh, more eastern areas of, uh, of Russia. Also, we know that farm salmon have um, uh, diverged in some ecological traits, uh, which I will come back to, and also in, in genetic markers. Uh, escaped farm salmon uh, have been monitored in Norway since 1989, also a few years before that, but but my colleagues made a, a monitoring program in 1989, and we have followed every, every year since 89 um, the proportion of escaped farm salmon in, in uh, um, the sport fishery, which is the triangles on this curve. And you see the uh, proportion of escaped farm salmon in the sport fishery during summer has been, apart from some years, has been somewhere between five and 10 percent. Uh, and this is quite a good monitoring because it's all of the scale samples that are sent in by sport fishermen fishing all along the rivers from 1st of June till end of August in basically I think some years we have samples from 100 rivers, last year from more than 100 rivers. Um, the autumn as the investigations is a sort of um, an organized fishing, so it's fewer fish. And, um, and uh, the autumn 
uh, investigations often show higher percentages of farmed salmon. Uh, one reason is certainly that they, they uh, come earlier into the rivers than what, farm, what wild salmon do, uh, likely because they are homeless when, when a, a farmed fish escapes. Uh, if it escapes during smolt migration, it may, or during the smolt period in, in uh, late spring, a farmed fish may sort of find its way back to that area. But then it has no home, so it enters a river in that area, but somewhat later than what the wild salmon will do, which knows sort of what river to choose. Uh, uh, um, uh, farmed salmon escaping uh, at Christmas is, is completely homeless. So, uh, so we may have uh, recaptures from uh, southern Sweden till, to uh, Murmansk in, in northernmost Russia from one single uh, release. And they also have much uh, lower survival. Uh, a fish escaping during the year, it is becoming mature will often stay in the same fjord where it is farmed and then r run into the rivers in the, in the neighborhood. Um, we also believe that farmed salmon may be are eas more easily if they come into a river late autumn, they are more easily caught by hook and line than, than uh, a wild salmon. So that may also be a reason why we get a higher proportion of farmed fish in autumn. Uh, in some of our um, investigations or some of our calculations, we, uh, we often make an average between the percentage of what we see in sport fishing in summer and what we see in autumn. So basically all of the years from, from 2000 until today, this average has been uh, around or a little above 10 Ten percent. Um, here are some of the uh, knowledge gained from controlled experiments uh, in River Imsa, Norway. Uh -huh. This one, where we have a two-way fish trap. In one autumn, we put uh, twenty plus farm spawners and twenty plus wild Imsa spawners. And then we followed uh, the fate of their uh, offspring in the next generation until they came back. In Burishul in um, Ireland, um, they did another type of experiment. They planted the eggs of salmon and then they followed the survival of the different groups they made uh, throughout uh, life until they were uh, ready to spawn. And also they made a second generation uh, with new planting of eyed eggs. And the same has been done in uh, Guddalselva, which is a river in Western Norway, um, where the Institute of Marine Research has done uh, experiments. At IMS, uh, our field station, we also do experiments in extremely small streams, like these uh, four meters by 0.25 meters, uh, where we look at competition between uh, offspring of farm salmon and offspring of wild salmon. Uh, collectively, these, um, these studies show that offspring of farm salmon in the wild have a somewhat different life cycle than what the, uh, what the wild salmon has. Um, their growth rate is, as expected, somewhat higher than that of wild fish. And then uh, in our experiment, they smultified earlier than wild fish, whereas it seemed like their um, marine life history was quite similar to the local IMSA fish. Whereas in Ireland, they had roughly the same smolt age, two years. Whereas uh, in comparison with Irish fish, which came back very early and small, the Norwegian farmed fish came back later and, and bigger. 
Also in this Imsa river in Norway, we have a, a very long um, timeline of the relationship between the number, number of eggs spawned and the number of smolts produced in, in the river. And in this one year where we had a mix of 50% farmed and wild spawners, we saw that from the number of eggs laid, uh, the population was 30% less productive in producing uh, out-migrating smolts than, than the sort of the historical number from, uh, from the same number of eggs to the smolt stage. Um, in, in the long run, um, yeah, also I should say that in the IMSA experiment, uh, the individual uh, lifetime fitness, sort of the, the number of individuals to the next spawning generation, um, was much lower from, for a farmed fish than for a wild fish. A farmed fish had a sort of a lifetime success in terms of offspring at 16% of what the, what the wild fish had. Um, and then we might think that it is sort of weeded out, but if, if, the, in, if the number of escapes into a river is very high, then, then the consequence, um, as it was in IMS, uh, is likely a, a, a reduction also in the total population. Uh, we have, it's not easy to, to estimate the impact of escaped farmed salmon in, in Norway because farmed salmon come from wild salmon. So what, what we had to do was, was uh, to look at a large set of so-called SNPs. They are, can be viewed as point mutations. They are, it's short for single nucleotide polymorphisms. And we looked at four and a half thousand SNPs. And we asked the question, uh, is, is there sort of a general difference between all of our samples of wild salmon? all of the blue lines here, and we collected wild salmon from the Tana all the way down to Numedalslogen, and we collected fish from sort of before fish farming, and then we collected uh, the three biggest uh, breeding, or salmon from the biggest breeding companies, and the uh, four year classes from each of those uh, breeding companies in Norway. And then we asked the computer, uh, can you find among these four and a half thousand SNPs, some SNPs that are diagnostic for the blue wild group, as opposed to the uh, yellow uh, farm group. And, uh, the compu and this is sort of ignoring the difference between farm strains and ignoring the difference between wild populations. And the computer came up with a set of 60 SNPs that collectively are quite good at distinguishing one group for, from the other. Uh, so this next figure is, is um, uh, here we have farm fish uh, as uh, the orange uh, dots. And then we have two groups of wild fish. Uh, the bottom group is uh, southern Norway, and the uppermost group is uh, northern Norway and uh, towards uh, Russia. And then, so this is sort of a, um, a tree of life uh, of uh, salmon in Norway viewed from above. And then we make statistically sort of a line um, between wild salmon from the south and farm salmon. And every individual is tested uh, to see how much it resembles wild fish 
as opposed to how much it resembles uh, farmed fish. And we make a different calculation along this other line from uh, sort of the Barents group, how much does one fish uh, resemble this uh, center point as opposed to how close it is to the, to the farm fish. Um, and and um, these, these are the historical populations. And we ask sort of all of the modern populations we can also place on this line between here and there. Uh, so, so um, uh, then we have looked at uh, at sort of the genetic uh, mix of farmed fish into wild fish in um, more than a hundred rivers uh, throughout Norway, and uh, and here is the here we sort of. Um, show the in introgression or incorporation of farm genes into wild fish in 100 rivers. I will, I will show a different figure later which more color on it. But here, sort of the dark spots uh, are quite introgressed, whereas the light spots are not. And uh, we find the darkest points in, uh, in Hordalan, Sogn og Fjordane, Møre og Romsdal counties in the south, and, and Troms county in the north. And uh, Hordaland has, has for a long time been our, our biggest fish farming uh, county, whereas we find more lighter colored uh, populations in uh, Rogaland in the south. Um, Rogaland is sort of divided between uh, no fish farming here and quite a lot further north. And then we find also lighter spots in the Finnmark, which so far has not so much fish farming, but it is increasing. And if you look at the, sort of this annual percentage of farmed fish in the population, we see that the more farmed fish in the population, this is sort of an average over 25 years, our estimate of genetic introgression uh, is higher. Uh, also, there is a lot of variation around this line. And we believe that one of the factors that are important is uh, sort of how dense the wild spawning population is or how dense it is as opposed to how dense it should be uh, if a population has a low population size from, uh, from uh, one or more causes, then it seems that uh, it's more vulnerable to escape farm fish because there is sort of free spawning places even for farm fish that are not very good at spawning. Uh, last year, when we were working on this, we were asked to, by the government to, to classify, um, classify Norwegian salmon populations with respect to impact, genetic impact from farmed escapes. So we did this in, in uh, or in cooperation with the uh, two researchers from the Institute of Marine Research. And we were asked to, to classify populations into one of four groups, which the government called um, no change observed or no genetic change observed, weak changes indicated, moderate case changes shown, large changes shown. Um, and this was how, how the result was according to our interpretations of these four groups. The green is no uh, genetic uh, change observed, uh, sort of from introgression of farmed salmon into wild salmon, which is roughly one third of the rivers 
Um, then we had indications, the yellow in another third, and uh, we had moderate or high uh, uh, genetic changes from interbreeding in, in, uh, in one third. And these 125 rivers, they represent more than three quarters of the wild salmon resource in Norway. So this result means that, that there is quite extensive impact that we can show already after roughly 30 years um, of, of fish farming in, in Norway. Uh, also, we do studies where we look at uh, broodstock for stock enhancement. And um, um, uh, the blue, the blue uh, bars uh, on this graph is, is sort of a, um, a check uh, of this uh, wild broodstock, uh, how much they resemble farmed fish. And uh, we put uh, this stippled line is uh, sort of a, above which we recommend that they are not used for, for uh, broodstock. So uh, I think uh, uh, we recommended 14.5% to be excluded as broodstock in 2014. Um, this is sort of an ugly slide from what our uh, genetic status uh, estimates look like. We, we um, for this example, for, for the river Alta in northernmost Norway, uh, at Nina we have a, a baseline uh, population from 1982, and we compare the likelihood of being wild uh, for, for all later fish uh, with that sort of baseline uh, sample from 1982. And uh, in, uh, in 2014, uh, our estimate uh, of uh, incorporation of farm genes into wild Alta salmon was 5.5% and highly significant. Uh, so, therefore, we put uh, Alta in this uh, moderate change shown, whereas if we find more than 10% introgression, we, um, we would have put it in, a, in the red category, sort of the large uh, changes shown. And uh, one could sort of quarrel in terms of exactly what percentage should be used to put to categorize fish as being moderately changed or or largely largely changed. Um, Ten percent introgression, like what we have in uh, in Hordaland County uh, last year, when when uh, my colleagues looked for wild broodstock in uh, Hordaland County, uh, they had to discard almost uh, or more than 40% of the fish. So that's, that's what an average of 10% introgression means, that, that maybe as much as 40% of the fish have sort of uh, some incorporation of farmed genes into its genome. So when we use these uh, categories, this is sort of what uh, the previous slide would look like that we have the red dots, uh, large genetic changes shown, or 10% introgression of farm into wild fish. And I should say again that all of these fish are, are hatched in the wild, and these are samples of adult salmon. Uh, but some of these fish uh, are obviously uh, descendants of uh, either a direct descendant of a farm fish spawning with a wild fish, or two farm fish spawning with one another, or they may be grandparents or, or later. Okay, enough genetics. 
a few words about uh, other threats to uh, salmon populations. Um, this is a slide from the scientific committee for um, giving advice to management in Norway. And it is in Norwegian, but the, the y-axis is sort of the estimated impact of uh, one particular threat to salmon populations. And, and high impact is sort of um, escaped farm salmon, salmon lice, uh, gyrodactylus, uh, freshwater parasite, acid rain, uh, hydropower regulation. Uh, let's see, we have over harvesting down here. We do not believe it's a very important factor in Norway anymore, except in the Tana River in the far north, which is uh, a serious uh, fact. But in most rivers, it is not seen as a major threat. But then along the x-axis, we have something called uh, risk for further damage. And that is how well this committee views the, the management actions uh, towards a particular threat. And in their view, uh, escaped farm salmon and salmon lice, which has a ring around them, is, is not well controlled because uh, salmon lice is still a problem uh, near fish farms for not only wild salmon, but also sea trout and sea char. And escaped farmed salmon are, are still at, a, at a, a high level in Norway. Um, in terms of uh, salmon lice, we know that on a smolt, uh, if, if a smolt has, has more than 10 lice, uh, it may be deadly for a uh, salmon smolt, which is a quite small animal. Um, salmon lice seems to be an increasing problem in Norway, e even in northern Norway, where the water is uh, quite much colder than what it is in, uh, in, uh, along the south, uh, southwest. And uh, the last few years, uh, fish farmers have struggled to control sea lice. There, there are regulations on how many sea lice they can have on each fish. Um, and if they are over that limit for a long time, they, they uh, have to, to slaughter fish in the end if they cannot control it with, with chemicals. Uh, the problem is that sea lice are becoming resistant to most of the chemicals that are used to fight sea lice. Then there are other possibilities like, uh, like uh, cleaner fish and maybe freshwater pumping, uh, maybe forced uh, water flow on, on the side of the fish. Uh, uh, sea lice control costs fish farmers an extremely high amount of money. Uh, last year, likely 5 billion Norwegian kroner, which, which would be 75 billion Icelandic kroner. Um, so I believe that sort of a technology, a new technology has to develop in order to fight, fight the sea lice problems. And then there is a, uh, a lot of discussion on how sea lice affects uh, wild salmon. Um, the, we know that the mortality of Atlantic salmon from small stage until they return as spawners is quite high. It's more than 90%. Uh, so some say that the extra mortality of, of sea lice um, on salmon smolts in, in big experiments where you feed, you protect some smolts by feeding them with this, with feed, feed with these chemicals. And then you have unprotected smolts, 
and the estimates is between a 10% advantage or a more than one third advantage uh, if, if uh, you have this protection. But then some others say that it's only one to 2% mortality which can be ascribed to sea lice. So it's, let's say, 2% on top of these 90 something percent. So, um, we, are, we are actually actually talking about the same proportion, but it's sort of being, um, being viewed on the positive side as only two percentage points, and on the negative sides of two percent out of those six percent that are left after 94 percent die of other causes. So, uh, so uh, obviously, if, if you expect to get, let's say, uh, uh, 100,000 fish smolts leave the river, you expect 6,000 adult salmon back, but you only get 4,000. It's only 2% of those leaving as smolts, but it's uh, quite a, a stab at the number of returning fish. Okay. Um, I will end by saying what uh, I think are the major implications for Iceland. When, when salmon farming is being built up, you should expect escapes. And uh, I would advise using local source populations rather than Norwegian farmed salmon and also improved containment technology. I believe Iceland has uh, an advantage for sort of closed containments because you have inexpensive energy and you have access to uh, almost sterile, both uh, salt water and fresh water. Uh, and also with containment technology, I would think about uh, sterile salmon. Uh, today it's rather inexpensive to make salmon triploid. That's an extra chromosome set, which makes the salmon sterile. Uh, triploid salmon are not doing very well in, uh, in uh, high temperature ocean conditions, but uh, in northernmost Norway, and I believe in Iceland, they should, be able, should do quite well. They get oxygen problems when uh, when the temperatures are too high, but not at the temperatures we saw here, 10, 12 degrees, I think they are fine. Also, you should, should expect problems with sea lice and other disease agents. Um, and sea lice, because it's possible to do, if you do a sea lice treatment before salmon smolt leave the river, you can maybe send them to, uh, to the ocean uh, with little uh, attack of sea lice larvae, whereas uh, sea trout and sea char, they are in, in the neighborhood of the coast, all of their oceanic life, so they may be much more vulnerable to sea lice. Um, and then also you sh should expect in the long run that the highest uh, interbreeding and highest interaggression of farm to wild salmon will happen in these intensely farmed uh, regions. And protected areas, I noticed from the map that you have larger areas in Norway, and I think that's a, a wise management decision. But, but um, and in, in those areas, you should expect, expect smaller problems. Um, in Norway, um, only one third of the populations that we have looked at, and we have looked at a lot, they show no genetic change of farmed introgression, or no sign of farmed introgression, whereas some show, uh, almost the same number, show moderate to large changes. Um, yeah, and then there is a couple of other conclusions that I just uh, told you about from Iceland. Um, also, a Proactive management is necessary. That you sort of you need a management that can look look into the future and um, 
and be prepared for for uh, for problems to come and also i did not write it down but you should make sure that you have a good monitoring program uh, sort of knowing what the starting point is on both atlantic salmon brown trout arctic char and then uh, um, uh, following the population's uh, sizes, following uh, genetic changes, uh, following uh, sea lice. Thank you.